Hello everyone, welcome to lecture three in GIT 437 and 573. Today we're going to cover a few things just really briefly. This will be a shorter lecture than most. There's a lot of material in the textbook that you'll want to read to cover this information and a lot more that will be on the test and that will come to play in your discussion and in your um, technical report. But I just want to hit on a couple of things real quick. First of all, we're going to discuss color acuity a little bit more. This is a topic that was covered in your last discussion board post, so you should be fairly familiar with it, but we'll just go a little bit more in depth. We'll talk about uh, standard viewing conditions, and then we'll finish up with delta E, which is something that's going to relate to your assignment this week, your first assignment. Okay, so color acuity, um, for our purposes, we're going to describe this as the ability to perceive and differentiate color. Um, specifically the degree to which one is capable of doing that accurately. So different people have varying levels of color acuity. Some people are better than others uh, at differentiating colors, and there's nothing wrong or right with that, but it is something you need to be cognizant of in the, the graphics industry. So if, you're, if your job relates to reproducing color, then it's pretty critical that you know that. And so our past two discussion boards have both talked about that topic, uh, color acuity specifically. So some of the things that can affect our, uh, our color vision, uh, we've covered already things like illusions and the color illusions that we looked at and, uh, and lots of other things, but it comes down to the fact that our eyes just can't remember colors. Our brain and eye combination just can't remember a color value. What we can do is compare one color to another one. So we can say that relative to this version of ASU Gold, that yellow is the same or it's different or, you know, whatever color we're talking about. We can compare one to another. So, but we can't really, um, like, visualize a specific color with any degree of accuracy. So there's a lot of factors that will affect that over time. And this is something that you need to test regularly for. If you're working in a color critical field, like a press operator, for example, that needs to do constant press checks, then you can test this regularly. And you guys did a little bit of a test. We'll talk more about that uh, here in a bit. But from age 18, your, your vision kind of peaks at age 18, research indicates our color vision starts to, to go downhill after that. And I'm, I'm living proof of that myself. <laughs> As you age, it starts to get a little bit worse, both your, your visual acuity, just how well you see detail, but also your color acuity. It starts to go downhill pretty rapidly once you hit age 40 to 55. Um, As our age, our eyes age, the, uh, we start to get sometimes kind of a yellow tint, a, a filter almost over our eyes. And that can definitely affect our color vision. The, the muscles of the eye control the pupil or contract or expand the iris more rapidly or slowly, depending on our age. And, and that in turn can also require more illumination. Uh, older folks can uh, require as much as 50% more illumination to be able to see the same amount of detail and the same color that a younger person would. Uh, another factor that can affect how we perceive color is the viewing conditions that we're looking at that in. And this is something we talked about a little bit before and that you've read about already too. But when we're viewing print specifically or images on a monitor or a vehicle wrap or a window cling or whatever it is, it's important that we consider the lighting conditions that we're viewing that in. So those of you that are photographers, you're familiar with degrees Kelvin already. Um, this goes back to a Lord Kelvin. I'm not, I should have researched his name actually, but anyway, he invented a contraption that was based around a black body radiator, basically a piece of metal, black metal that was chilled, very, very cold. And as it was heated up, uh, as metal tends to do, it started to glow as an electrical current was run through that metal. It started to heat and, and as it approached different temperatures in degrees Kelvin, that light that's emitted from it, because light is just energy, right? So as, a, as an object emits light, it gets hot, it emits light, this radiation, then that, that temperature at which it emitted different colors or different wavelengths of light could be measured. So the, the image on the right-hand side on the slide 
is a color um, simulator uh, made by a company called GTI. And it's not a color accurate viewing booth, it's just a demonstrator. Uh, so you can see really easily there that those three segments uh, have different color temperatures. The one on the right is very, very warm. The one in the middle is very cool. The one in the, the left-hand side has got kind of a yellowish cast to it. And those are those are kind of exaggerated samples of, of different lighting conditions that you might experience in the real world. Uh, 5,000 degrees Kelvin would be more like direct sunlight. 6,500 degrees Kelvin would be, there's a slight differentiation, it's, it's daylight. So not direct sunlight, but light that's kind of filtered through a whole lot of blue atmosphere. It's a much cooler, visually cooler color temperature. If we're talking about that black body radiator, then it's a, an actual hotter temperature. 7,500 degrees Kelvin, that would be a much bluer color temperature still. Now those degrees Kelvin, those correspond to the temperature or the, the light output from that black body radiator. The 50 DIN or 65 DIN, those are terms that are used um, in a German system. I'm not sure how relevant it is to us, but I included it here for reference. Uh, what we're concerned with is the, the numbers on the right-hand side, D50, D65, and D75. The D system of uh, viewing conditions is, is based on um, some theoretical light sources. So I shouldn't I should specify that this equal is not really equal here. What you see on the slide, those bullet points, it's not truly equal. D50 is kind of equivalent to 5,000 degrees Kelvin in that the color temperature visibly is going to be relatively the same. However, uh, the spectral curve, think back to spectral curves in your reading, and the, the reading talks about this in more depth, but you should be aware that D5, uh, D50 and 5,000 degrees Kelvin D65, 6500 degrees Kelvin, and so on, they're not precisely equivalent. Um, you can attain a 6500 degree Kelvin white balance with various combinations of color spikes throughout your spectral curve. But D65, as a viewing condition standard, is very specifically a, a predefined spectral curve that's emitted. Uh, you know, and you're not going to really experience that lighting in the real environment under any actual light source. So it's a very specific controlled spectral curve that's going to give per certain proportions of each wavelength um, at set amounts. So that said, let's move on. Make sure you do the reading on that. <laughs> the reason that's important is because of how we see color. Remember, we can differentiate the difference between colors, but we can't remember a specific color. Now, if we're comparing colors and it's how we perceive color and differentiate them, then it's really important that we're viewing them under set conditions in the same conditions over and over. Let me jump back to the slide here. If we look at the exact same image under one light source and another, the color is obviously very, very different. Uh, you would evaluate it very differently. So it's important that you view under the exact same conditions. So D50 is typically going to be used for print production, graphic design that's going to go to print. D65 is going to be a more standard viewing condition for things like digital display or photography. Um, D65 is typically what's going to be white balance for your monitor calibration and, and computer monitors and screens are typically balanced towards D65. So that's a major factor that's going to affect your color acuity is, is actually having a correct lighting standard. You're viewing it under the, a consistent lighting condition, uh, the angle of incidence. So what angle is that light coming from? If you're, you're using a viewing booth, like as described in the textbook, then your angle of incidence is going to be better than if you're viewing it through light coming in sideways through a window in the afternoon. Uh, you're, you're viewing this where there could be a reflection, and you're seeing the light source more than you're seeing the color of the object that you're viewing. The angle that you're viewing it, this is really obvious with things like monitors. If you have a, a cheap computer monitor like mine, then you view it from an angle, you're gonna see a big difference in color there. Uh, the distance that you view it, the size and shape of the color areas, if you view uh, colors of a certain size or shape, 
then sometimes our brain's going to adapt to that. Things like think back to the color illusions that we looked at before that you may have seen elsewhere. So there's adaptation that takes place in the way we view color. Okay. To kind of alleviate some of those issues in terms of, well, just the, the standard lighting conditions, there are indicators that can be purchased to use in these, uh, these reference checks. So on the left hand side is a Pantone branded D 50 lighting indicator. These are little stickers that you peel off and you'd actually affix to, uh, a, a proof, a test proof. And, and you could use that because I don't know if you can see it really well on the display here, you see it better on the image on the right. But both of these stickers do the same thing is that under certain types of lighting conditions, you will get a very different appearance on the sticker. So looking over here on the right hand side, cause it indicates better. This is a, a, a REM lighting indicator, R H E M light indicator it says if stripes are seen, light is not 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So this is going to help identify that because really easily, if I'm looking at a print and it has the sticker on it and I see those bars, it's very obvious that I am not viewing this under the correct lighting conditions. Uh, same thing, the strip down on the bottom, cool white fluorescent light is going to cause the stripes to light up differently. And this is because the material properties of that sticker are such that metamerism comes into play, which if you think back, that means that certain spectral energy distributions are going to cause colors to show up differently than others. So if we get even good D 50 close to D 50 lighting, we'll get a nice solid sticker. If we see these lines, then we know that it's not. And the, the stickers on the left, the Pantone version, they do the same thing. It just doesn't represent it quite as well on the screen here. All right. So this should look kind of familiar to you all, uh, since you did that as part of last week's discussion. This is the Farnsworth Munsell color vision test. Now this is the actual test. What you did online is just kind of a simulation. And there's so there's a lot of variables that are going to affect the accuracy of the test that you guys took. But this version of the test is highly accurate and it it's got to be done in a controlled environment. If you can tell from the image, it's being done in a, in a viewing booth, a color booth. And so there's D 50 lighting, even consistent lighting. There's a gray surrounding all around it. So you're not influenced by other colors. Typically you would do this as one strip at a time. So that again, your vision isn't influenced by the greens, the blues and the purples, and you do one set of color chips at a time on the underside of each of those chips. There's a number so that you can be scored. So once you, once the uh, participant has completed that test or one strip of that test, uh, someone else would come and they would score that they would turn over all the chips and make sure they're all in the same order and then add up that score. And that score is going to be a measure that you would hope to remain consistent over time throughout your employment or improve on even. Um, and if it changes drastically over time, that might be an indication of some other condition, some of something else that's affecting your color vision that might need to be uh, taken into consideration and dealt with. Okay. Delta E, this is the last kind of thing that we want to cover here real quick. Delta E is a measure of the difference between two colors. It's simply a number that we use to indicate how much difference there is between two colors. Uh, the Delta stands for difference and E stands for error. Uh, the appropriate way to write this is with the Greek symbol for Delta, a little triangle there pointing upwards and the letter E. So there's a formula for Delta E where we can solve basically the distance between two points in a three dimensional system. So LAB is a three dimensional system. There's an X, a Y and a Z um, axis for each of those color values. There's luminance and there's the A and the B axis with our red green contrast and yellow blue contrast. And we can actually calculate because that's a numerical system. We have a value in 3d space for each color. We can test one print. And, and measure the LAB values of a color. And we can compare that to the LAB values of, a, of the same color printed elsewhere or on a different substrate or whatever else. And we can quantify that difference and say whether it's within an acceptable range or not. So here's our LAB uh, really, really simplified version of, of LAB. We've got those, those points where we could map out a coordinate for every color within this space. 
and it's not a circle. It doesn't look quite like this. It's probably more like a grid. If you think of a, a large hotel with an elevator going up and down, we've got the elevator and it goes up and down. So floor zero would be black and floor 100, let's say just for simple numbers would be white. And then right in the middle, floor 50 would be gray. So if we take that up and down, we go into these negative or positive values. That's kind of how our elevator is. And then we can get off at any floor along the way. If we get off at a floor and we turn left or right, it's going to give us a different coordinate. And then if we go, let's, uh, this is assuming the elevator is in the center of the building. We get out and we go this direction, then that gives us a different coordinate. So with a Delta E calculation, we can say that room 112 is, you know, X number of feet or yards or meters or whatever from room number uh, 317. And, and ignore those numbers, they don't mean anything, but just to kind of hopefully give you the idea a little bit more. This is maybe a little bit better construct of kind of what's going on with that calculation. And, and this, this isn't totally accurate here, so ignore the graphic a little bit, but if, if it helps you visualize a little better, then looking at the formula down below, then that's the point of this being in the slideshow, is just to kind of help the visual learners. So we have point one and point two, which is our reference, our original print, our original color, and we have a reproduction of that color, and we want to make sure that they're the same. So over time, a press operator might be comparing um, a print at the beginning of the day with the later end of the day to make sure that the equipment hasn't drifted, the color hasn't drifted or changed over time. Or let's say that a client has provided you with a reference print, a uh, test print, and a contract proof, that's been agreed upon and then the press operator needs to attain the exact same color or within a certain tolerance of the same color. And a Delta E calculation is going to allow you to, to say mathematically that those are the same colors or they're close. So earlier on, you guys talked about uh, the effects of color blindness and how instrumentation can be used to kind of get around the fact that we don't all see color quite the same way. Yes, to a certain extent, this is the type of thing where we would use instrumentation like a, a colorimeter or a spectrophotometer to measure colors and compare whether they're the same or not. So here we go. Calculating the delta E. Going to work like this. So we've got our original color or our, our reference image or reference color, and we measure a color chip, color value, color patch, whatever. And we, we attain these values. So 49 for luminance, 52 for A and eight for B. So using those three numbers, that is a certain color, you know, whatever it is, I don't even know. These are random numbers. <laughs> Our sample two or the reproduction or whatever we want to call this version. This is our second version that we're, we're trying to match. So this is our color. This is the one we're trying to match to, and you can see the color values don't come out quite the same. They just don't match. They're not quite the same. So 55, the luminance, this one's a little bit brighter, isn't it? The A and the B, they're pretty close together. So just looking at those values, we could, we could say, yeah, they're, they're pretty close. They're kind of close, right? But they're not exact. So we really need to be able to quantify exactly how much different those colors are. So here's the formula. There are different versions. I should give a disclaimer, different versions of Delta E calculations. Uh, and they're typically designated with the year that they kind of went into practice. So there's, this is the 1976 version. There's a 94 and there's a, uh, 2000 and, and, and on and on. So over time they get more accurate. This is probably the least accurate, um, technically of all the Delta E calculations, but it is the simplest mathematically. And so we're going to keep it simple. So <laughs> don't read too much into it. And I'll tell you why it doesn't matter too much for us other than to get our project done, which is educational thing, not a practical thing necessarily. So the way the math works here, we take our, our sample two, which is going to be our L2, our A2 and our B2 values. And we just plug them in here. So 55, 50 and nine. And each of those, we do a little bit of subtraction here and put in our sample one values, 49, 52, and eight. And then we square those, we add them all together, and then we take the square root of those. And that gives us our delta E value. This is uh, just a, a distance formula. This, so if you, if you Google um, Euclidean 
distance, this is basically what that is. So for we're calculating a distance between two points in 3D space. That's all that's going on. It's just geometry. So this gives us our delta E value of 6.4. Now 6.4 is, is uh, for reference, kind of a high value. But the thing to consider is that the big difference is brightness. Our colors, looking at those values, they're not terribly off, but this would be a visually different color. If you put those two colors next to each other side by side in a D50 environment, you'd be able to perceive the difference there as being significant enough that it's noticeable. So depending on the contract and the, the institution or the facility that you're working at, you're going to have different values. But for reference, a delta E of one is probably not going to be noticeable to the human eye. Two is getting to uh, the limitations of some print equipment two is the best you're going to get uh, above that up to about six or seven or eight then that's the point where it's not acceptable any longer so that's the range of, of values if we get up to like a hundred delta e then we're talking about colors that are the exact mathematical opposite of another color so that's kind of for scale the range of delta e values all right we're going to talk real quick about some instruments but be aware that this is just very, very brief and, and mainly to point out some things that you want to be aware of when you do the reading. So just uh, a quick overview of instruments. There are three main types and we're, I'm only going to talk about densitometers here because it's the least important. I'm going to let you guys read and study about colorimeters and spectrophotometers on your own. But the reasons to use a densitometer are because they can measure things like dot area and dot gain. Uh, trap and print contrast. Those are three things that really don't have anything to do with color specifically, but they are going to affect other characteristics of print quality. So uh, we're going to skip over that. When you get to the reading on densitometers, don't focus too much on it because it's not as critical to us in this class, uh, but it is a, an important tool in press operation, but uh, really other than checking the density of ink on a substrate, that's really what it does. They don't measure color necessarily. So um, this isn't a, a hardcore printing class. A lot of color management does relate to printing. We're not going to get into these terms a whole lot. Um, you can look up trap and dot gain and, and total ink value and, and things like that if you're interested in it. But uh, for our purposes, I just want to point out that those things that densitometers are good at measuring aren't as relevant to color management. So color emitters and spectrophotometers, that's where you're going to want to spend your, your attention. These instruments have different modes and I just want to uh, hit on those again to kind of point out the things that aren't quite as relevant to you. So emission mode is where uh, a device can measure light that's being emitted. So think of things like computer monitors or screens or devices. Uh, reflection is where the device itself is emitting light and it's measuring the light that's being reflected back from that material. So think print. Ambient is some devices have uh, an additional setting or apparatus that can measure the ambient light in your space. So if the lighting conditions change, the device can notify you of that. But typically you can notify yourself of that too. If you turn the lights on and off or uh, something like that. Um, I, I'm skeptical of those type of devices. <laughs> um, transmission is is an, is one that you're not going to be terribly, uh, you're probably not going to run into too much in needing to use that sort of thing. That would be a device that can check film. So if you've got transparencies or slides or film, then that's what those that light is being transmitted through a material. All right. Um, like I said, it was going to be a brief lecture. There's a lot of important information to cover in the reading. So make sure that you study that. It is a short chapter, but it's dense. Um, the, the quiz is going to be talking about some of the material in the previous chapter as well. So as will be the case throughout this class, the, the material is going to kind of build one week upon the other. And it doesn't, doesn't tidily overlap with just the chapters of the reading that are assigned. So be prepared to be kind of flipping back and forth throughout the book as we go.